We're concluding part two of our series called Reading Between the Lines. It's a series that we are helping people enhance their biblical literacy by understanding how to read the different genres of the Bible. Because if you don't read the Bible as a book that is comprised of different genres, you will read it incorrectly. So over this whole calendar year and next year, we're going to be teaching you how to read the Bible in a great way. And so we're going to the parables, the stories of Jesus, so that we can learn how he used the stories to lead us to deeper spiritual truths. And there's one story that I love that I think is so poignant and apropos for where we are as a nation and where we are as a people around the world. Now, some people, no matter how much the advance notice that they get, they're just never prepared. I mean, today, some people just were not prepared, right? You just woke up and you got after it, whether it's before a vacation, a camping trip, a scheduled dinner, or a business meeting. Some people just come shorthanded and ill-equipped and not prepared. Many of us know what it's like to be around somebody and they come on vacation, but they have to run to Target because they didn't bring any swimming trunks or they, didn't, they forgot their lotion or they forgot their hair gel, or whatever it is. They RSVP, but they weren't prepared. And when you are prepared, you feel smart and you feel you know, secure. But when you're unprepared, we often feel ashamed, foolish, or stupid because a lack of preparation can come with penalties. And when we're not prepared, there can be penalties. The place that more of us in this room, and for those of us watching online, are mostly not prepared, and I think I'm going to get a good amen out of this, is many of us are not prepared because we often don't put enough gas in our automobiles. Is there anybody in this house that is notoriously committed to not filling up your tank to the last minute or you're dating somebody or married to somebody that does not fill their gas? Oh, yes, there's a Shekinah that's moving through the house right now, right? Like there's a spirit of God. We all know that a lot of us procrastinate where we should be prepared. So according to AAA, Last, this, just, this cycle, 194,000 people called because they were out of gas from January to April. <laughs> That's a 1.8% increase of all roadside assistance calls during that period. Let's hope those people didn't call from New Jersey. Anybody ever drive in New Jersey? They'll pump your gas at the gas station, but the, you got to get an airplane to get to the next gas station because... They're so far in between. If you have to get roadside assistance in New Jersey, you're going to die. That's basically <laughs> what's going to happen. Just dial it in. See, a lot of people just are not prepared. In fact, it seems like it's worse in the UK. I read this startling statistic. Nearly 3 in 10 drivers, 28% of people, some 11 million people admit their vehicle has run out of fuel before, rising to over half of 18 to 34-year-olds saying that they often run out of gas. I'm never going to the UK if that's the case. Too many people presume instead of being prepared. And in the text that we're about to read, we won't talk about three out of 10 vehicles, but we will talk about five out of 10 virgins or bridesmaids that actually struggle with the same thing around preparation as it related to oil or to fuel. In the story, we'll see this contrasting difference between a set of wise bridesmaids and some foolish bridesmaids. We'll call them virgins in the text. And we'll learn this leadership principle that was coined, I believe, by John Maxwell. He says, when opportunity knocks, it's too late to prepare. And for many of us in this room today, opportunity is about to knock. But the question is, are you prepared? Are you prepared for the opportunity that's in front of you? Because the context here, Jesus is speaking to his disciples who were anticipating the coming kingdom of God. Now, they were anticipating it for the wrong reasons. They were thinking that the Messiah would come and upheave the Roman oppression that they were experiencing. But here in the text, Jesus is trying to talk to them about a kingdom that would usher in peace and joy and beauty to the world. And it wasn't about replacing oppression. It was about putting his rule in place as the Messiah. And he says to this listening audience, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins or bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, it's not uncommon for a metaphor to be used by Jesus around a wedding context to express the second coming 
of the Messiah. And he's here trying to help this audience enlarge their mentality. And what would happen in this context is that a bridegroom would return from a, a, a journey and come back for the wedding feast celebration. And these young bridesmaids would illuminate a pathway, would be like a procession that would allow him to come back. Now, there's a lot of details that are admitted in this story. We don't know who the bride is. We don't know all the details. But we do know that a groom is coming back. And I think for us, as we listen and peer into this wonderful story, we have to say that the virgins in the story represent people who believe in God or would be Christians in our context. And these are people who actually want to see and are connected to the bridegroom coming back. But then there's also this other group of people that want to, but they're not prepared. They, they, so, so Jesus says five of them were foolish and five were wise. Now there's classification here for a purpose because they're all bridesmaids and they all look alike and they all have the same opportunity to prepare for, but they're so different. They're so, so different. They're supposed to have oil and they're supposed to have lamps and they're in the reception area. They've RSVP'd, they're excited, but we're told that the foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. They weren't prepared. They didn't fill up the tank like we would in our culture. Now, before we get a little bit too far in the story, these are not lamps like you would think of with a wick in it and, you know, it have oil and you turn it up. These are more like tiki torches <laughs> that they would have to have. They'd have these large tiki to torches that would have oil and stuff in it. And in the text, the word torch here or the word lamp here is better interpreted as torch. They didn't have their lamps or they didn't have their torches. They were not prepared. They took no oil. They had lamps, but they had lamps that were not useful. They, they, their job was to provide light, but they couldn't do so because they were inadequately prepared. It'd be like bringing a candle without a wick or a, a flashlight without batteries because partial preparation is unpreparation. Just because you carry something doesn't mean that you're ready. So they have religion, but they have no conviction. They have something, but it has no transformational power. They walk around with what's necessary for an outward show of preparation, but they have nothing going on internally. They are people that have this last-minute mentality when they should be critically prepared for what they need to do. These five foolish virgins look just like the wise virgins. There was nothing different from them. They rocked the Life Church volunteer lanyard just like every other volunteer. But something was so different. Well, you know, I'm always laughing about how people look like other people, like celebrities look like regular people, regular people look like celebrities. In fact, I have some friends that are notorious for making side-by-sides. I do it as well. I got this app on my phone where I make side-by-side -side photos when I see somebody that looks like somebody. Take, for instance, Pastor Jim, who's on stage. Why don't we throw that side-by-side that, uh, -side that I made up? He looks just like... <laughs> Thorin Oakenshield from The Hobbit. Every so often, if he grows his hair out for Halloween, it's a wrap. He don't got to do nothing else. Game over. Why don't we throw up one of our wonderful worship leaders here? I love him. This, this is Luke. Luke's a great guy. He can sing the lights out. He <laughs> is Luke here today? This is savage. I didn't even tell him. <laughs> this is what I do sometimes. <laughs> And then I have notorious people in our congregation that will send me side-by-sides while I'm preaching or before I'm preaching and stuff like that. It'll show up. And uh, a dude in my church who I will not reveal, um, he, he, he made this the other day and sent it to me while I was sitting on the front row. There, there it is right there. That's me in high school. And that's Kevin Hart in high school. And um, <laughs> striking resemblance. There's a lot of times that... Somebody looks like what they should look like, but they don't do what the other person does. They all came to the wedding and they all looked alike, but some were wise and some were foolish. In fact, the wise ones took oil in jars along with their lamps. They were prepared. They took their role seriously. They knew that they were expecting for the bridegroom to come back and they didn't want to be ashamed. They had expectations, but they also had preparation because having expectation without being prepared is a mess. 
And so the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. This is a clutch mentioned because, remember, Jesus is explaining through the story the coming kingdom of his return, ultimately. It's an analogy. It is a parable that is talking about the second coming of Jesus. And if there's any time that is relevant for us to talk about this, it's now. Have you seen what's going on in the Middle East right now? Jesus prophetically said that there would be wars at the end times. And today we see the current war of Israel against Hamas. We see the growing danger of nuclear war all around our world. We see earthquakes and other natural disasters. California has more fires in history in the last 10 years than in the last 100. Think about it. It's been raining, as Pastor Jim said, since January. It, it, it's, it's odd what's going on. The Bible says that in the last days, people would be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This is the end times, everybody. And unfortunately, too many Christians look like people that are prepared but are not prepared. Too many of us are not even thinking about the return of the Lord. You don't even think about it. And the first church, their whole evangelism was driven by their view of eschatology. Eschatology is the theology that Christ is coming back. So the reason why they told all their friends about Jesus is because they believed Jesus was coming back and they didn't want their friends to have a life separated from Christ. Christians nowadays do not think often enough about the second coming of Christ. So here's what happened, though, for these virgins in the text. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up, and they started trimming their lamps. In other words, they started getting the oil ready. They started making sure that the tiki torch was dipped fully and immersed. All 10 of them slept, which is not bad. You can go to sleep if you're prepared. Because when you wake up, you've already done what you needed to do to face the day. So here in this text, Jesus is not trying to tell us not to sleep. They were all awakened by the same news, but all slept, but all weren't prepared. Notice not them knowing that he wasn't coming was an issue. That's not it. It wasn't the timing of the bridegroom. It was the timing of their preparation. And he came at midnight during that good sleep, the REM sleep. That's when he came. So the wise virgins, they got ready and they needed to go. But here's what happened. The unwise virgins started to wig out because panic is the result of a lack of preparedness. So when we don't have, well, we're not, what, what am I going to do? What am I? So the foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out, which is technically a lie. And that's what people who are not prepared usually do. They lie. Did you read it? Just a couple of verses up. It says they brought no oil. But what did they tell the people with oil? We're running out of oil because they didn't want to look bad. And when we are not prepared, we usually try to make ourselves not look bad. They thought the resource to their light could come from borrowing it from somebody else during the last minute. And a lot of us can do that sometimes. It's so true about people that profess faith. You can serve on a team but not have oil. You can go to a life group but not have oil. You can worship during a four-song song set, have no oil. You can go through all the missions that have no oil whatsoever. You can be one of those people that just look like you have oil, dress like you have oil, wear a church hoodie and merch like you got oil. Can I preach a little while? But you have no oil in your life. And what happens is you try to borrow it from somebody else. You try to borrow somebody else's obedience, somebody else's prayer life, somebody else's commitment. But preparation can't be borrowed. I've seen this at times even with my own daughters. My daughters are hating me. For the last four weeks, I've just been preaching about how much they annoy me in one way. They're actually lovely kids. But every so often, we'll go on a trip, and they'll get all upset because one of them forgot their charger. And God forbid if their phone dies. And they'll start arguing, Haley, let me borrow your charger. Haley, let me use your charger. Haley, let me. But the truth is we do that spiritually as well. We come to places and we want to borrow everybody else's charger to fill up your own soul when you should have. So, so what happened in the text is that the people, the other virgins that were wise, they said, no. No. 
no, mm, 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 mm. There, 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 there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some yourself. Does that sound savage? Does that sound bad? Well, to me, it sounds wise. Because sometimes when you distribute what you have to others, you may not have enough for everybody, including yourself. So here's what I know. You can't give a person a mature spiritual inner life. You can't transfer that. In fact, it can be a detriment at times. In the context of this story, sharing their oil might have meant that all 10 would have run short of oil. And there's a correlation here that is obvious to me. It's about the Holy Spirit. Without oil, the wedding party was not ready for the bridegroom. Without the Holy Spirit in your lives, you are not going to be ready for the second coming of Christ. So if you're unsure about the Holy Spirit in your life, you, get, you better get sure. You better get prepared. This is old school preaching today. This is, listen, man, uh, uh, olive oil and oil in the scripture always represents the Holy Spirit. Why? Because oil lubricates for the right purposes. It allows the friction of the world not to wear you down. So when you're full of the Holy Spirit, the world can't wear you down with all of its attempts and its fear and all of its false doctrine. Oil heals. It's the medicinal treatment in biblical times. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit helps heal parts of our lives and our traumas and our sicknesses. Oil, it allows us to have light. That's the one of the reasons why they needed it in their lamp so that it could illuminate the darkness. That's why we need the Holy Spirit inside of us so that we can put a dent in the darkness. It, it warms when you put it to a fire. And if there's any time in our culture where it has been cold, it is right now. Oil, it invigorates us. When you get a massage with some oil on your shoulder, it does medicinal things into our body. It is a perfume. It is a power and you need the Holy Spirit in your life if you're ever going to contend and be prepared for what God has for you. Because here's the deal. While, while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. And the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. It, it, it's an analogy that the door will become shut for some of us. So you got to be ready. I, and I'm not talking about Tiffany Haddish ready like she ready. No, we're not talking. We're talking about being spiritually ready, okay? Because sometimes we try to do things and it's too late. Going to get oil wasn't bad. It was just too late. <laughs> the oil was still good. The intention was still good. But the timing was horrible. And ladies and gentlemen, we need to pay attention to what's happening in this story. Because this is why we need to be prepared. Some of us are sleeping, which is not bad. But some of us are sleeping, but we're unprepared, which is bad. Here's what Paul told Romans. He says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the spirit. If you have the spirit of God living in you, and remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in, in them do not belong to him at all. Remember those tags that you had when you were a little kid? This lunchbox belongs to? The, the Bible talks about having this seal. The Lord knows who are his. Who are the people that are his? Those that are filled with his spirit. So let me, let me get practical for a little while, okay? Are, are you all right, everybody? This is, uh, so we're learning from this story. All right, so here it is. You have to guard your daily disciplines. So many of us are unprepared because you don't have a spiritual daily discipline of seeking God. You don't pray every day. You don't re and remember what we said last week. Prayer is not about the length of time. It's about the loyalty to it. So just getting up and saying, listen, you can't win Wimbledon if you don't practice like Serena. You can't win games unless you're practicing when nobody is looking. You might want to borrow somebody else's six-pack, but you're going to have to Photoshop it on. <laughs> if you don't eat right and if you are not spiritual, listen to me, you can't buy preparation and you can't borrow it either. And some of us are trying to have oil and be prepared by osmosis. It's like, well, I come to church, so by osmosis, I should get oil in my life and I should be filled with the Spirit. But that's not the way it works. Because being a Christian is not about who you're friends with, but it's who you're filled with. So it doesn't... It doesn't matter how spiritual your friends are, you need to have people that are around you that are filled with the Spirit, but you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to have the power of God in your life. Here's what Paul says. He says, and I love the way he says it. This is kind of funny because it's a little snarky. Don't be drunk with wine. 
because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, be filled with the Spirit. Have the oil inside of you, not just on you. Be consumed with God's presence in your life. And if you're here today and you want to learn more about what it looks like to have a spirit-filled life, to be filled with the gifts of the Spirit, to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We want to equip you to do that. That's one of the reasons why we have life groups here, because we want you to be equipped. In fact, the Gilwits are here today. I want Roy and Kathy to stand up over here. Roy and Kathy, stand up. God bless them. Jane, stand on up, too. You too, Jane. Stand on up. Ellie, stand on up. Why am, I, why am I pointing these people out? Because these are people that are passionate about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They want to see you equipped to live the life that God has for you. You need to get in a group where you can learn about being filled and prepared. And after the service, they're going to be out in the lobby. You can talk to them. If you're saying, oh, man, I'm hungry for more. I feel like preaching. If you feel like, man, my life is just not full, get around some people that will help you get filled. They ain't going to let you borrow their oil, but they will teach you. Uh, they'll teach you. And I'm going to help you as well, okay? Because later, the others came and they said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. They looked alike. They even talked alike. They called him Lord. And there's so many of us that call Jesus all the right things. Jesus is warning us in this parable that there are a number of people who look like Christians, who connect with Christians, that dress like Christians, that update their Facebook and Instagram like Christians. But they're going to be shocked one day to find out that you are not a Christian. Because being a Christian is about knowing God. You can know scriptures and not know God. You can know segments of theology and not know God. You can serve on this team and know how to serve and play music and not know God. I can preach and not know God. You can attend church and not know God. That's why Jesus says this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. Salvation is about knowing God, not knowing how to do what God likes us to do. That's called religion. (laughs) Where you can do what God wants people to do but not have it transform your heart. And Jesus Christ tried to save us from religion. And it's important to know God in this life. But you want to know what's more important than knowing God in this life? God knowing you before the afterlife. How does that happen? The Holy Spirit has to fill you. He replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour when the Son of Man is going to return. So how do we integrate this into our lives? We have to stay alert. you got to be alert. There's a big difference between what you profess and what we produce. So just because we profess that we're Christians, we have to produce fruit of the Spirit. We have to have this constant assessment of where you are spiritually. Can I ask you today, where are you spiritually? Are you filled with God's presence? Are you filled with joy? Are you filled with peace? Because here's what God's calling us to be. The world's blowing up and acting crazy and all this stuff. I heard all these different reports. New York City's going to do this. You know what I did? I walked around New York City as a non-anxious presence, saying I'm going to have joy and I'm going to have peace. If they, I'm, I'm not going to allow myself to be terrorized by the threats of the enemy. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. I'm going to be... I, that, doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't mean not being wise. It means being prepared. So, so, so you got to resist the temptation. You got to prepare for the crisis moments. You got to be prepared. I had a guy that I went to school with in Bible college. His dad was prepared for World War IV, not even World War III. He was like World War VI. He had more cans of corn and green beans. He had a room downstairs. He was re- he was gonna eat for the rest of his life. He was prepared. Jesus said, when all these things happen, when you see what's happening with Israel, when you see what's happening in Iran, when you see what's happening in North Korea, when you see what's happening in North America, when you see what's happening all around the world, you know what he says? He says, look up. Stop looking at Fox. Stop looking at CNN. Stop looking at your Instagram feed. Start looking up. Why? Because that's where God is. Look up because your salvation is drawing near. Stop worrying about what everything Your salvation is drawing near. I got this guy at my gym. He's, he's amazing, right? And, and, and he's a volunteer fire worker. But, but at the gym, he'll have on his shorts, his, you know, his nice Lululemon and all that stuff. But he's always got his walkie-talkie on the side of him. And some of y'all that work out with me, he's always got it. And I'm telling you, if it goes 
and there's a, there's a call to go do something, your man is beelining out of the gym because he's always on. I'm like, you can't work out for an hour without the big old walkie-talkie over there doing dips with the walkie-talkie. I want to borrow it to just curl it or something like that. The walkie-talkie is the size of his leg. Like, <laughs> but he's prepared. Here's, the, here's what I love. I thought about this the other day while I was getting on this way. He can't prevent fires, but he's sure prepared for a fire. We, we, we can't prevent what's going to happen, but we sure can be prepared for it. Here's what the Bible says. My, watch out. Don't let your hearts be dull by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Stop worrying about everything in this life, everybody. Don't let that day catch you unaware. That's what the Bible is teaching us. Like a trap, for that day will come upon everyone living on the earth. So keep alert at all times. All the times, not just not just when the world is going crazy, because we get scared when everything is going crazy. But it's when everything is calm is when the enemy tries to come in and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the son of man. Are you prepared is the big question. World news is going to be world news. Are you filled with God's spirit? Here's the thing. When I grew up and I, start, I first started getting into church, I think I've talked to you about this before. I was so afraid of the rapture and God coming back, right? Because I always felt like, you know, I'm definitely going to hell, right? Like, I'm just like, I'm bad. I do bad things, da, da, da. But I would watch my grandmother and other faithful Christians. They were always looking forward to it. They're like, come today, please. I, I want to be with you. I can't, I can't wait. There's a difference. Why? Those people really know God and trust God. So I want to relieve all the pressure. If you're going home and and this message and you're just nervous and you're scared, that's not the attempt of God. The Holy Spirit brings peace and comfort and and, and wholeness, but you you, you still need to be wise. It'd be foolish for you to leave this service and not be filled with the Spirit of God. I'm being serious. I'll open up this altar. We could come down. I'll get some prayer partners and stuff like that. You, You shouldn't leave this service unprepared. I just got to be honest with you. And it's been a long time since I've preached with this level of passion about preparedness. I don't want you to be scared. I'm not scared. I'm not afraid. I'm being serious. I want, I want all of us to be a non-anxious presence in a world filled with anxiety. In fact, this is a seed message because I'm going to teach in February four weeks about the coming of the Lord. I'm going to teach you about the rapture and I'm going to teach you about what the Bible says in Revelation and Daniel. I'm going to help you so that you're like, bring it, Lord. Come on back. I can't, I can't wait. Get me. Oh, my God. Come on back to be ready. I remember a couple of years ago, Pastor Jim's here. We were headed back from Birmingham, was it? We were coming from this conference and, um, in Alabama. This was, you know, we're all from New York here, most of us, at least, or maybe you came from a different place. But years ago, it, th- there was no Chick-fil-A's in New York. So when you went down south, you had to get Jesus chicken. It was like, that's what you do. So we're at this conference, and um, <laughs> we're like, we're so excited, and, and, and we're getting ready to fly out of Atlanta, but we drove from Alabama to Atlanta, and um, we got, on the way, we got a text message that said our flight was delayed, and um, for like an hour or two, two hours or something, so we're like, yes, we're going to a Chick-fil-A, I think Ozzy, you were there with us maybe, but there was a, there was a bunch of us there, and, and we were so excited because we were going to Chick-fil-A, a freestanding Chick-fil-A, we ain't talking about a kiosk, we ain't going to Terminal C in Atlanta, right, we are going to the one where it's freestanding and we're just in there, chicken, nuggets, Polynesian sauce, barbecue sauce, waffle fries, yes, Jesus, lemonade with the iced tea, Holy Ghost is moving right now, filled with the Jesus food spirit, right? And so we're eating, and then all of a sudden we get a text out of nowhere from Delta that says, your flight is back on time. Polynesian sauce all over our shirts. We're in the car. We're pulling off. We're out trying to get to the airport. And I think we ended up missing our exit. And we were late. So we get to the airport. Has anybody flown through Atlanta? You know you can lose weight flying through Atlanta. Come on, somebody. We're running. Car. We're here pulling. Jimmy, 
He wouldn't even help me with my bag. Knapsack, running, running. And we're trying to get down to the gate. And we get to the gate. And everybody who was on standby occupied our seats. Because while we were running, something else happened. A gate change. Have you ever had a gate change in Atlanta? You got to take four trains. You got to take a regional jet from Terminal. <laughs> so we're running and we missed everything because the gate changed. And I mean, I'm going off. I'm mad. I'm like, what are you talking about? I had a seat. I had this. And we're just going off and da-da-da. And the, 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 the person at Delta said, hey, just look at this part on your ticket. It says times are subject to change. <laughs> you shut up quick. <laughs> the carrier had the right to determine when the passenger should show up. And the carrier had the ability to change the times. Some of us are going to be at Chick-fil-A when we should be sitting at the gate. Some of us should have took that Chick-fil-A to go and sat at the gate. <laughs> Let me just tell you how unspiritual Pastor Jim is. There was one seat that came open. It's Saturday, Ricky. I got to preach tomorrow. America is shut down. All kind of stuff. One seat. And I was like, man, I, you know, I'm kind of feeling bad. I don't want to be like the, you know, over spiritual pastor that's like, you know, the man of God needs to do his work on Sunday. So I'm like, oh, you know, Jim, you could take it. And he's like, no, no, you, you go ahead. And I was like, no, nah, man, you take it. He said, okay. <laughs> Am I, he knows I'm not lying. <laughs> Took the flight and left us in Atlanta. <laughs> Talk about Heather got a, a, a conference she got to go to. His wife. But the Lord vindicates the evil. You know how God got him back? He got on that flight and ended up not getting back to New York. They had to land in Philadelphia. <laughs> he hit Pittsburgh and he had to drive all the way from Pittsburgh. I was home by the time he got home. <laughs> it's the oil. That's why you got to be filled, my God! You'll get a non-stop flight. Let me close it this way. You can live in fear or you can live prepared. And the better choice is for you to live prepared than to live in fear. So don't walk out of this service afraid. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to do this last practical application. Build the church. Why do I, why do I say build the church? Because you should be prepared building something that has eternal value. Thank you for the one person full of oil over here. Just Jane is full, okay? Build a church. This is why we ask you every week. Serve on a team. Get in a life group. Give your tithe. Give financially. It's not because I need anything from you. I don't need anything from you. I want something for you. And, and, and here's Noah. I don't have time to preach it. I should have did a series. Come back in February. But be prepared. <laughs> that February may not come. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> sorry, it's not in my notes. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm sorry. <laughs> Off the rails. But, but listen, Noah was told that judgment was coming. He never saw rain in his entire life. So what, is, what do you do when God tells you something that you've never even seen before? We've never seen Christ come. You're like, oh, yeah, whatever. But he built something that he ended up having to board. I think you need to build a church because as you build it, God will allow you to board it 
Noah and his family were the only ones that were saved because he didn't play a part. He was a part. Here's what Peter says. Above all, come on up, team. I want you to sing. We're going to worship him a little bit more. Any of you want to worship God a little bit more before we leave? So... Here's what the Bible says. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. So there's going to be a bunch of people that have a logic model. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I'm not trying to judge you right now. I think that intellectually I can make a case for the second coming of Christ. And I would love to talk to you about that. But if you're not a Christian here today, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, that's not ever going to happen. That's so crazy. They're going to say things like, where's the coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything is going on as it has since the beginning of creation so people will say well there's no Jesus isn't coming this is like everything's been the same but here's what Peter says he says don't forget this one thing Peter was a friend and a follower of Jesus he says with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises some understand slowness instead he's patient with you not wanting anybody to perish but everyone to come to repentance so in other words, the only reason why he has to come back is because he's a good God, waiting patiently, wanting to fill you with all of his presence, wanting you to be prepared. And I just want to get you guys to live with the level of expectancy that my grandma did. She was looking forward to the coming of God all the time. And I used to just bank on it. For, for the last couple of weeks, I, 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 there's been this light on my car. And he says, I need engine oil. Pastor Jim is nodding his head because I've asked him three times, hey, can you, can you get that? He don't want me to have oil in my car, in my life, in my nothing. I'm busy. I'm just like, can you help me? And, and the light just keeps flashing every so often. But guess what? I just keep thinking I can drive it. I'm like, I'm just going to drive it. Whatever, you know, I can get to. And, and one of these days, I'm going to be calling somebody, say, hey, 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 can you come pick me up? I need to go, this is true, this is true. I need to take to go get the oil thing in my car fixed. And for some of us, the dashboard of your life has been telling you for a while that you're empty. You know it, but you keep trying to fill your oil tank with antifreeze. And you're wondering why things don't work. Sex, drugs, money, affirmation, it's all antifreeze if you put it in the wrong place. And God's trying to say, you need oil. Here's the last thing I'm going to say. The team's going to come and sing. So just as each person is destined to die once, all of us are, afterwards comes the judgment. A lot of people do not believe in judgment. And I'm going to tell you, there is heaven and there is hell. There is separation from Christ forever. And you don't want that. It's the reason why Jesus came, so that you don't have to be separated. And you got, we all got to stop playing games and be prepared. So hearts big and open wide to God. Come on out, Pastor Johnny. Come on and sing that song for us. Come on. Hearts open big and wide to God. Come on, everybody. Sing it with us. Your name is here. Your name is light. Oh, break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Sing it all together. Sing your name. Cause your, your name is high. Come on, we're talking about the name Jesus. Your name is Come on, the name that one day every knee will bow. Your name one day every tongue will confess that He is Lord. Come on, we don't have to wait. Break every strong. Break every strong. Oh, shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Come on, shout Jesus. Shout Jesus. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, we say, Jesus in the darkness, oh, hey.
Your name is healing. Come on, do you need healing Hands today? Up, everybody. Your, Your name is life. Yeah, yeah. Break through. Break every song. Shine through. Shine through the shadow. Sing it, Tony. Come on, hands up still. Hands up, everybody. Hands up. Your name is power. And your name is here. And your name is life. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Break every storm. Break every storm all of my life. Shine through the shadow. Every head bowed, though. And this is for the people that are here today that would say, I am not prepared in the way that I should be prepared. You can live in fear or you can live prepared. We don't want you living in fear. But if you're here, this is the moment of the service we call a fresh start prayer. And if you need to make a fresh start with God, you don't have salvation. You know you don't have a relationship with him. Or you walked away from your faith and you've been like, eh, I'm, I'm good. Today's the day for you to be prepared because none of us are good. We need the goodness of God transferred to us through the sacrifice of Jesus. And that's what's going to happen. So if that's you and you're in this room, while nobody's looking around, I want you to raise your hand up in the air and say, that's me. I'm going to participate in this fresh start prayer. Look at that. One, two, three. Come on, raise those jokers high. Yeah. This is beautiful. Look at how many people are raising their hands. The only reason why we're counting is because we want you to know that you're not alone. And our team is counting. There's a lot of people that are saying, hey, I want to be prepared. Come what may, I'm going to be prepared. And then I'm going to give some space for some of you after this. Roy and Kathy are going to call some of us. we got to dismiss the service. The band's going to stay up and play a little bit because I want to give you an opportunity to be filled with the baptism of the Spirit. You can come down here and pray. Now, now, here's what's going to happen, everybody. We're going to say this prayer together for the people that raise their hands. Keep them up. And they're going to they're gonna feel the, the, the power of God move in their life. So help them say it like this, everybody. Father, Father I've, sinned, I've sinned. And I'm sorry. And I'm sorry. But today, today, I make Jesus, I make Jesus leader, leader and Lord, Lord of my life. I believe he died. And I believe he rose again from my sin. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and with strength to follow him. All my days, in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's celebrate that decision that they made today. Come on, everybody.